How do you assess fuel delivery on the vehicle that you're testing? We've always been taught that fuel pressure is important, as is fuel volume. Well, I have a little different way of looking at fuel delivery, and that's the topic for today's edition of Service Done Right. This edition of Service Done Right is brought to you by Carter. To learn more about the entire line of Carter products, visit www.carterengineered.com. How we provide atomized fuel into the combustion chamber has evolved significantly over the last 50 years, but how we provide the fuel to the delivery device hasn't changed all that much. We still use some form of pump to keep the delivery device, whether it be an old two-barrel carburetor or piezoelectric GDI injector, fed a constant supply of fuel. We were all taught how important it is to check the fuel pressure and compare that to specification. We were also taught that it's important to check the volume of fuel being delivered, though that's commonly overlooked. But what if I told you that these two were merely indications of the most important thing you need to consider when it comes to fuel delivery. Ultimately, the ECM, or engine control module, has to make sure that the right quantity, by weight, of fuel was being added to the combustion chamber and at the right time. Isn't that what the 14.7 stoichiometric ratio means? That for every 14.7 pounds of air, one pound of fuel is needed. I ask you to consider how much time do we actually have to deliver the right quantity of fuel to the combustion chamber? In the days of carbureted engines, we used an open intake plenum with the carburetor mounted on top. So fuel was essentially being delivered constantly to the intake runners and eventually to the combustion chamber. Time was not an issue. And because of that, we could use a low flow, low pressure fuel pump that was just needed to keep the carburetor float bowl full without overpowering the float valve. Then we moved on to throttle body and eventually port fuel injection engines. This required a higher fuel pressure because now the window of time to get the fuel into the combustion chamber has been narrowed. It was still pretty wide though, so in order to control exactly how much fuel is being added, the PCM would calculate how long the injector had to remain on to deliver the right quantity of fuel based on the flow rate of the injector and the operating pressure it was under. In these designs, fuel is added to the intake track well before the intake valve even opens, let alone before the air-fuel mixture is compressed and ignited. But what if you don't have that kind of time? Consider today's GDI, or gasoline direct injected engines. Fuel isn't added to the combustion chamber until the very last millisecond usually just before ignition. So how do we adjust to achieve the ultimate goal of getting the correct amount of fuel into the combustion chamber? Rather than adjust the time the injector is actually open on a GDI system, we change the pressure that the fuel is being delivered by. Low load, low RPM pressures of around 3 to 400 PSI are normal while High load, high RPM fuel demand may see pressures reaching almost 3,000 PSI. Another reason for the higher pressures of GDI systems, especially at low load, low RPM, is the increased pressure in the combustion chamber itself at the time of fuel delivery. Consider a typical engine compression pressure of 120 to 140 PSI. If we tried to use a 65 PSI standard fuel pump like we're used to with port injected engines, as soon as the injector opened and instead of the fuel being delivered to the engine, it would be blown right back to the fuel pump. Along with the need for high pressure also comes the need for added safety. This is done by supplying a more local high pressure pump with a conventional low pressure pump in the tank. And that's the kind you're used to. And like other conventional pumps that you're used to, the low side pressure pump sometimes called the lift pump, 
can be tested as you have always done using volume and pressure as your test indicators. The challenge on these systems though is diagnosing the high side pressure of the system. Again, with pressures ranging from three or 400 PSI to nearly 3000 PSI, there is no way for us to connect to the fuel rail and measure it with a conventional gauge. We have to rely on our scan tool. Luckily, most OEMs provide us with two relative data PIDs, desired fuel rail pressure and the actual fuel rail pressure. It's one thing to have high pressure under high load conditions, but it's another to have the right pressure for the different load conditions. By performing a road test while graphing these two data PIDs and operating the vehicle under a variety of load and RPM conditions, we can get an idea of just how well the pump is able to keep up with the demand. Desired pressure is the target the ECM is trying to reach based on its programming. The actual PID is, of course, what the pump is able to deliver. Variations between the two may indicate an issue with the pump or regulator valve. One common problem associated with the high pressure pump is wear on the pump plunger or on the cam driven lobes that actually operate the plunger. Keep in mind too that cam timing can result in problems with the high pressure pump delivery. If the timing of the cam is incorrect, the pump is out of sync with the crankshaft. Senecium not knowing this is not closing the pump chamber when it should, reducing the overall delivery pressure that the pump produces. If it does become necessary to remove the pump or detach the lines from the pump, always be sure to follow the OE's recommended procedure for doing so. High pressure remaining in the lines can and will hurt you, so make sure that you follow the procedures for bleeding off that excess pressure and that you verify it's done by looking at the data pit on your scan tool. Of course, always wear your personal protection equipment to be even more on the safe side. Now, if you're removing the pump, be sure that you loosen the mounting bolts slowly a little at a time so that you gradually release the spring pressure the plunger is under to avoid damage to the pump or other components. And the same thing applies when installing. Tighten them down a little at a time until the pump finally seats and then use a torque wrench to make your final tightening. Don't forget, the high pressure lines also require being tightened and meeting a certain torque spec. Don't forget to use your torque wrench there as well. And on some manufacturers, you may even have to replace the lines, even if you just broke them loose. And if that's what's stated in the only procedure, do it. It's not worth the chance you might be taking to reuse a line that's not designed to be reused. No matter whether the engine is carbureted, throttle body injection, port injection, or gasoline direct injection, the end result is the same. We have to get the right amount of fuel into the engine at the right time. If you think of it this way, you may find troubleshooting issues in that area a lot easier to figure out. Thanks for watching.